is a Biblia Hebraica Pseudocartensia. As well as the Septuagint, Latin Vulgate, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Biblia Hebraica, and the third edition of the 1937 of Rudolf the Behaes is based on the Leningrad Codex, originally edited by the Karl Eliger and the Wilhelm Rudolf in cooperation with the numerous other scholars, and the revised fifth edition from 1997 was prepared by Adrian Schrenker. It is based on the St. Peterburg Public Library manuscripts. Uh, B19A, the so-called Leningrad Codex. While the main text of the BIS follows the Leningrad Codex almost exactly, the critical apparatus provides readings from a variety uh, of other sources, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and the Targum, and among others. I'd like to share with you the, some illustrations of the Old Testament text from the uh, 1525 and uh, other, uh, the PHS, uh, 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 the critical uh, apparatus. So, some differences. While the New Testaments, uh, they have uh, the textual receptors uh, as a last different uh, from other any uh, West Coast uh, West, West, uh, 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 and Horat uh, edition, but uh, in Old Testament, uh, the text itself is uh, not uh, that much different, uh, but the problem is the critical apparatus. And uh, we have some abbreviations of some using ASV, American Standard Bible, JPS, the Masoretic Text, and the JPS edition, 1917 and the King James Bible, Modern King James Bible, New American Standard Bible, and the New International Version, and New King James Bible, and the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, this is I wanted to compare uh, each other. Uh, first thing from the Genesis uh, chapter 1 to Ruach Elohim, they omitted the Spirit of the God, but instead uh, they uh, put the wind of God. In the Genesis chapter 1 to say that Ruach Elohim, Murachefet Al Punei Han Ahamai. This King James Bible right translation, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of waters. And then JPS, New American Standard Bible, they are also same thing as uh, Spirit, but the uh, JPS they use the small s rather than the capital S. And the New American Standard Bible, they put the, uh, the capital S, the Spirit of God. But New RSV, they changed the wind from God. A while a wind God from God swept over the face of the waters. And uh, this is the last change. We have Trinity God and uh, change the one and two, they first mention about the spirit of God, Ruang Elohim, but why they changed the wind from God. This is a wrong translation. They mean the, uh, they changed the meaning. Genesis chapter 125, here there's a U at the Ha This is a Milu, is imperative form. King James Bible, they said, Replenish. This replenish meaning is fill with the people, the earth. But the JPS, the uh, same thing, uh, replenish, but the other translation, the fill the earth, they reduce the meaning. So, Ma'u means more than to fill, but replenish. That's a fill with people. And the other change, they changed the humanity to neutral being. That's a chapter 2-7, Genesis chapter 2-7. He will say that, Va yohi ha adam le nefishi kaya. Nefishi kaya 
meaning is a, a living soul. But modern translation, they change it to a living being. King James Bible, modern King James Bible say that a man became a living soul. But uh, NIV, the American Standard Bible, RSV, they change the being, just the being. The human being consists of a spirit and a soul and body. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 23 and Hebrew chapter 4, 12. But they change the, any being. It's just a neutral. In a modern translation, they change the man to living being like a ghost. It's not human being. So, they change the these uh, uh, things. Nefeshi Kaya. And uh, another example from Genesis chapter 2, 18 say that Ezer Knegdo in Hebrew here Ezer Knegdo King James Bible translation it is not good that a man should be alone I will make him a helpful made for him helpful made for him this is a spouse for Adam and the modern King James Bible, a translation, I will make a help suitable for him. This is a roughly good. But the other modern translation say that, I will make him help made for him. This is a rather good, but you uh, are a, uh, NS, ASB, a help suitable for him. And the new English Bible, partner for him and uh, enable a uh, helper suitable for him and uh, here another partner so help meet is the best translation for aesthetic connector why here aesthetic connector meaning the fa feminist movement does not like a wife being a help helper meet or feeding for men they emphasize the equality. The sense in Genesis 2.18 is the husband and wife should work as a team, as a counterpart, complementing each other, having specialized but different skill, just as the King James Bible says, the issue is not who is better as a suitable or compatible. So, King James Bible is the best translation here. The other issue from Genesis chapter 6 4, Nephilim issue. Here issue is a translation trans transliteration rather than translation. Here King James Bible says that giants And uh, here, mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Here, and I they say that any Nephilim, they do not uh, translate, but transliteration. Nephilim, he said. What does he mean, Nephilim? Yes, Nephilim is a kind of a fallen one. Uh, so, King James Bible, they were giants. And then, and I will be talking about the heroes of the old man of renown. According to the Numbers 13:33, Han Nephilim, King James Bible say that there will be so the giants, the son of Anas. And the uh, NIV they do not translate, just a transliteration, Nephilim. Their descendants of Anak come from Nephilim. It's very unclear. What does it mean? Nobody knows, understand. We seem like Grace Hoppers in our own and we looked the same to them. The other issue is who is the sons of who are the sons of Noah and what the order. According to the Bible, Japheth is the oldest one. Ham next and Shem is a third son. Japheth is the elder brother of Shem. 
according to Genesis chapter 10-21, say that, call Bonai Erek Ahi Yefet Ha Kadol. Kadol. This is Ha Kadol meaning the elder. So, Jephet is the elder brother. King James Bible, very correct. Unto Shem, also the father of all children of Ebel, Ebel the brother of Japheth, the elder. Even to him were children born. In the New, uh, New American Standard Bible say that, the older brother of Japheth, children were born. This is right. The, the, uh, this is wrong. This meaning is uh, Japheth is uh, younger. And the uh, you are as they say that to Shem also the father of all children of Abel, the elder brother of Japheth. He wrong. Jep, uh, Shem became the spiritual first son and the, the ancestor of Messiah. So you can look the Genesis chapter 10 genealogy of Noah. They talking about first one, first two Japheth, and next the Ham. And the first 21, the sons of Shem. So, Japheth, Ham, and uh, uh, Shem. Shem. So this is the order of uh, Noah's sons. The other issue. The God himself, the burnt offering, according to the story of uh, Isaac's sacrifice at the Mount Moriah. This is a prophecy of Messiah's work, but they changed the, the meaning. Look at Genesis chapter 22a. Said, El him ve re lo hase no ora no la. This is exactly God Himself is to become the lamb. Sacrifice, not to prepare for a lamb. King James Bible, they exactly translation. God provided himself a lamb. Himself sacrifice. And the modern King James Bible also same thing. God provided himself a lamb. But other modern translation translation like God will provide for himself the lamb. Not himself but for himself. And uh, you English Bible say that God will provide himself with a young beast. How about the NIV? God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And uh, New King James Bible also, God will provide for himself uh, the lamb. They put up for himself, for himself. And the new RS boy say that God will be provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So this is a twist from the original meaning. The Lord Christ is the lamb. You RS boy, God will himself provide the lamb for a burnt offering. And the modern King James Bible, same thing. And the Septuagint also, same thing. Ho feos, opsetai, he auto, probaton, eis, holo, karaposin. King James Bible and the modern King James Bible show that God Himself is to become the lamb sacrifice to take away the sins of the world. But other modern translations, including the Septuagint, they remove this prophecy, our Messiah's work in the future. This is a very important important uh, month. And we have some other uh, issues. Genesis chapter 90, uh, 49 and uh, 6b say that Ki be afam ha haragu ishi gu virus nam Ikru Shor. Here in King James Bible, 
and in their self will they dig the out of war. And the modern King James Bible say that, and in their self will they will hamstrung a bull. But other modern translation like this, and in the air self will they will hack an ox, or they lamb the ox, oxen, and the hamstrung oxen, and uh, as they preached the, the hamstrung ox, and they all changed the meaning. And the Genesis chapter 19, 10 say that, Lo, your soul uh, shall let me put up, who make cock bear faith, pain, who could uh, love, other key yabo, shilo, bolo, ikara ame, the scepter, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lower giver from between his feet until Silo come. This is the right translation, exactly. And the uh, Americans in the Bible, they almost uh, they follow King James Bible. But other modern translation, they twisted, changed the meaning. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a ruler step from between his feet until sorrow comes. And the new English Bible say that a little different. And the NIV say that different. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a ruler step from between his feet until he comes. And the living Bible, they omitted omitted some words. And uh, you as others will say that they are a little uh, changed here. The Living Bible completely omitted without explanation an important part of the Messianic prophecy. And then NIV and the new RSV they omitted the silence. The other illustration, Proverbs 27, 13. No Korea, ha black level. Your King James Bible, take his garment that is a surety for a stranger, and hold him in pledge that is a surety for a foreign woman. And the NIV, they changed, wayward woman. Septuagint and the uh, uh, Vulgata, they changed the Alotria, that's a kind of uh, strange uh, uh, man. And uh, uh, Proverbs 20, uh, 16 say the same thing. So, we have a last difference from the original meaning by modern translations. They changed a little bit from sometimes the, the word, sometimes the phrase, sometimes the sentence. And here another category, we have a divine name. Jehovah, or the Lord Elohim, Adonai Elohim. These things. Genesis chapter 17, 1. God said, I am El Shaddai, the God, Almighty God. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect, El Shaddai. To Adam and Moses, God was revealed as Jehovah. And the Masoretic text, mankind that's based on the King James Bible, they put like the uh, Jehovah, the Lord, Lord. Exodus chapter 3, 14 say that, Echoe, Asher Echoe. That's King James Bible, I am that I am, and other translation, I am who I am, and I am who I am. Some capital, some small letters. Jehovah the Lord is the everlasting presence one, 
the beginning and the end and the author and the finisher of faith this is the meaning of Jehovah the I was I am I will be in the future so all is uh, the present uh, the Almighty God how about the uh, Exodus chapter 3 14 Echoe Asher Echoe Septuagint say that Ego Amy Ho On the being only it's different last different from the original one I am who I am you are a it because the Hebrew is uh, grammatically problematic this translation is uh, uncertain that's uh, uh, also wrong uh, interpretation all the New Age Bible they omitted the Jehovah Exodus chapter 6 of 3 King James Bible I appeared uh, upon Abram unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty and by name Jehovah was I not known to them but NIV they changed this Jehovah just only Lord I appealed to Abram to Isaac to Jacob as a God Almighty but not my name the Lord I did not make myself uh, uh, known to them how about the Genesis chapter 22 he say that Jehovah Jireh. Abraham called the name that place uh, Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord I shall be seen this is this meaning of uh, Jehovah Jireh the Jehovah meaning the divine name is they keep in the King James Bible but NIV say that they omitted the Jehovah only uh, and the, uh, the Lord will provide the Lord will provide that's all not provide the Lord will be seen this is a literal meaning of Jehovah Jireh so the King uh, New RSV and the NIV they changed it twice they omitted the will be seen they omitted the Jehovah they changed that the Lord will provide. This is a wrong translation. That's the one, Jehovah Nisi. This meaning is, uh, Jehovah is my banner. King James Bible, the Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah is my banner. And the NIV say that, Moses built an altar, say that, call it the Lord is my banner. Only explanation. They omitted the Jehovah from that uh, place name. And that's the Judge chapter 2, 64 say that Jehovah Shalom. And the narrative of Gideon, then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. And unto to this, it is yet in the Ophra of the Abiezalites. But, NIV, they omitted Jehovah. They say that, uh, the Lord called it, the Lord is peace. Only translation, they omitted uh, Jehovah. The words of Jehovah in uh, Psalm 12, 6 and 7 say that, they were the words of Jehovah. Imrot Adonai. Imrot Jehovah. As silver tried on furnace to the earth and purified the seven times. And the first say that, Thou wilt keep them, O Jehovah. Thou wilt uh, preserve, uh, preserve them from this generation, O ever. So they put here, Jehovah, Jehovah. But modern translation, they, uh, they uh, away, put away uh, Jehovah. Here you are as we say that O oh Lord you will keep us uh, uh, safe and protect us from such people forever. They are uh, omitted uh, the Jehovah and then here they changed the, the them 
Them meaning is the word of the Lord, not us. They changed the this thing also. p e h a e s some uh, the manuscript s e p t u a g e n s say that Chishim Meranu. Here, NIV followed this wrong reading, so they uh, uh, they put uh, us something like that, protects us. No, this is a wrong uh, translation. They must uh, change, protect the word of God, the word of the Jehovah. This is translation, but they change the us. They just uh, put from the wrong reading from the s e p t u a n t s In Isaiah 12, 2, here also, Yah, Jehovah, Yah, Adonai. King James Bible, this, they will translate, they translate the Lord Jehovah. But NIV, they are uh, changed. They, the Lord, the Lord is my strength. They put the Jehovah instead of that, they put here. The Lord. s e p t u a n t s and the v u l g a t e probably to delete the Yah. This is the first thing, so Yah and the Jehovah. This is a, any emphasis about the name of the divine name, but they put these things uh, from the s e p t u a n t s So, uh, many problems. Here, apparently, The NIV does not like to use the blessed name Jehovah. Why? Is this come to accommodate the New Age readings? New Age movement. They are influenced by the Gnostics. Modern Gnostics, they hate the divine name. For anyone to alter the name of our Lord is ungodly and out of hell, of course they did, uh, does not... Uh, They don't, not, don't like uh, hell either, also. They put all here from the modern translations. Okay, our other illustrations. Some passages, they uh, change the, the number. First illustration, according to chapter 1 Samuel 6, 19, say that. Here, Vairek Ha'am Shivuim Ishi, Met Mishiam Elef. King James Bible, a translation exactly. And he smote the men of Beth Semeshi because they had looked into the ark of the Lord, even he smote the people 50,000 and three score of ten men. So, three scores of ten men. This is 70. And 50,000 altogether, 50,070 men killed because they looked into the Ark of Covenant. But in NIV say that they put away 50,000. They think it's too much. So God only smite uh, the killed only 70 people. So they put away uh, the 50,000. Only they put 70 of them to death. This is uh, wrong. And uh, JPS, the Jewish Bible translation, he smote the men of b e t h e m e s h because they had gazed upon the ark of the Lord. Even he smote the people, 70 men and 50,000 men. And even Jewish reading, they put the 50,000 here. So NIV, they omitted 50,000. Next, 2 Samuel 15, verse 2. This passage meaning, and it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. But the students, Syria, Josephus, they all put here 40 years, like the uh, same thing in Hebrew Bible, Mesoretic text. So here, Greeks say that 
تسارا هتی تسارا هتی but in NIV we say that at the end of four years Absalom said and like this they changed the 40 to reduce only four and the Korean Bible also same thing Korean Bible is the same with the new NIV so they changed the four instead of forty another case second Nicola chapter 22 here 42 years old Azariah but NIV say that here 22 they reduced to 20 and the second king 826 2 and 20 it's also 22 years old Azariah when he began to reign who killed Goliath? Yeah, absolutely David. David killed Goliath. We know the uh, first Samuel chapter uh, uh, 74. But modern translation, some other translation, Ehana killed the brother of Goliath, the uh, Gideon. Second Samuel 21:19. King James Bible, they exactly uh, translation. When the Ehana the son of uh, Jarol Ogim, uh, Petre might slew the brother of Goliath the Gideon. And I will, Elana, the son of uh, this man, killed Goliath, not the son of Goliath, Goliath. This is definitely wrong. And the uh, new uh, revised English Bible also, they killed Goliath, not David, but the, uh, the Elhana killed uh, Goliath. Septuagint's New American Standard Bible also same thing. But look at the first Chronicle chapter 11:26. Say that the valiant men of the armies were Ashael the brother of Joab, Ehanan the son of Dode of Bethlehem. So. And I believe it's uh, many, many cases, it's uh, inconsistency. Some part of this way, the other part of that way. Uh, it's uh, uh, not agree uh, each other. Homosexual issue. In the Bible, in the Kadesh, uh, this is uh, definitely homosexual. But they changed the, here, cult or shrine prostitute rather than the homosexual. They changed the Deuteronomy chapter 20, 17 in Hebrew Bible verse 18, Kadesh. Only King James Bible, Sodomite. Other translation, perverted one. A temple prostitute or of a, a Sodomite of the son of Israel. And, and I will say the shrine prostitute. They changed. They uh, just uh, hide the homosexual issue. And first Kings 15, 12. And the first Kings 22, 46. Same thing. Second Kings 23, 7. Also, same thing. According to the New Testament, so first Corinthians chapter 6 and 9 say that this is a homosexual. The new NIV edition, editors edited the eighth epidemic by silencing God's warning against the Sodom. And the modern translations go easy and vague on sodomites or homosexual issues, replacing it with a male shrine or temple prostitute or any cult prostitute as an obsolete arcade professional. Dr. Virginia Mole Koch, one of the uh, NIV translators, say, My lesbians, my lesbianism has always been a part of me, and uh, she confessed herself as lesbians. This is one of the translators of uh, NIV. And the other translation, 1 Kings 18 27. Here the better, uh, the Baal and the Asherah prophets in the uh, Mount of uh, Carmel, in the Elijah, say that, allow, cry aloud for his uh, not a God. 
either he's talking or he's pursuing. But in the Living Bible say that perhaps he is talking to someone or else he's out sitting on the toilet. This is nonsense, definitely interesting. The Living Bible is an inaccurate and corrupt interpretation of what the tailor thinks the Bible is saying on many issues. The first thing, the Bible translation must be an accurate to what is copying. What nonsense, there is nothing in the Hebrew language here requiring this ridiculous and strange translation. No other version has ever translated this as a bell sitting on the toilet. Idol issue. The 2 Samuel chapter 5, 21, King James Bible, and there, they left their images and the Devi and his men burned them. But other modern translation, they say they carried them and carried them away. They, they left their images. David and his men burned them. The modern translation did not know Deuteronomy chapter 7, 5 burned the graven, uh, graven image with the fire. And the uh, same thing, Deuteronomy chapter 7, 25. And the suicide issue. Job 40, uh, 14, 14 say that, A man die shall he live again. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. And the living Bible say that, I eagerly await the sweet death. Suicide issue. That's a very dangerous translation. And the hell issue, they put all, pull out all the hell from the Bible. They change it into grave or shiwal. They believe not in hell. Time issue, I just uh, skip over this one. And uh, they uh, omitted the divinity of God. So kiss the sun and uh, you are as well kiss the feet. They changed it. And Psalm 103, and not we ourselves, we are his people. And I will say that it is he who made us and we are his. They are different reading. And uh, here, King James Bible, Reverend, but the other translation was awesome. And the uh, prosperity. They changed the Proverbs, uh, righteousness, into prosperity. This is the, theory, uh, the theology of uh, prosperity. This is uh, very wrong. And uh, Proverbs 21, 21 also. They, they uh, changed from righteousness to prosperity. And I agree. Jeremiah 29, 11. Shalom, peace. They changed the prosperity. And also Isaiah chapter 9, 3, they omitted the not. Not. Lucifer issue, Isaiah 14, 12 and 5. They put away the Lucifer. Instead of the morning star, looks like the Messiah Jesus. And uh, Luke chapter 4, 8, they omitted, the, get thee behind me, Satan. They all omitted other modern translations. And the Son of God issue, Daniel 3.25. The fourth man is the Son of God, is the Jesus Christ. But NIV other translation, they look sons, a son of God. It's not Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is a creator. According to Micah chapter 5.2, say that whose going forth has been from the old, from everlasting. But they uh, changed, changed the other modern translation. Micah chapter 5, 2. This is uh, definitely Christ has origin wrongly making him a created being and I will make Christ a creature and not God. And uh, the time is up. Thank you for your attention and uh, God bless you. Thank you very much.
Greeting from South Korea. My name is Samuel Yoon. I wanted to share with you the understanding. Okay, very good. Well, Brother Grumblad, I guess you're ready to read the scripture for us. Here he's coming. That's good. Lights. Uh, Dr. Smith, maybe we get where right here. Let's see if we can get that. Don't seem to be able to. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, please stand for the reading of the scripture. We're in Psalm 119, starting in verse 73. Yo, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Let, I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to thy word, unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. You may be seated. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Let's get our hymnals again and... I guess uh, maybe we should have uh, Dr. Spencer the the lights back here. I guess it's getting dark, isn't it? Okay, let's turn to, uh, did we read, did we do uh, uh, 397 last time? Which was it? We did 396. Let's do 397. It's the rescue of the perishing. 397. Hymnals. Question and answer. Those who have questions, please give us a, a, a questionnaire. Questions at bftbc.org. Anywhere in the world, questions at bftbc.org. We heard one from uh, a person here, by the way, from Robert Schofield from Portsmouth, Virginia. He said, to the man who asked for soundbite responses to questioners, I often use this clever one when explaining textual issues which came to me to answer fundamentalist misinformation about deletions and so on. I say, take out a $5 bill. Notice it has a five in one corner, front and back. What if I gave you a stack that was missing one of those fives and just one of the corners on the back of those bills? You'd say, no way. They're counterfeit or those are misprints, etc. Then I say, but there are still seven other fives in the other corners, right? Wrong. And that is exactly the point. You only have to accept five dollar bills. You only accept five dollar bills when all eight fives are on them. Right? So goes the text issue. That's his answer for that. All right. 
We're glad to have with us one of our advisory council members, once again, Brother James Grumblatt. He's going to speak to us on the critical Greek texts, errors. And Brother Grumblatt, my Lord bless you as you come. Thank you, Dr. Wade. This is the fourth uh, session on this series. I started it four years ago, and we're talking about the errors in the Greek text. And uh, we started with Matthew, and I'm working my way through the book of Revelation. I wasn't able to make it last year, so we missed that year, but this is the teaching I would have done last year if I was down in Texas. So as a way of introduction, just as a reminder, According to Dr. Scrivener, the Westcott and Hort critical text differs from the Texas Receptus by 9,970 Greek words that are added, subtracted, or changed in some way. Those changes would be roughly equivalent, as we learned earlier today, to the text found in the first and second epistles of Peter thus modifying a serious accumulative portion of the New Testament. The critical text is much shorter in length than the Textus Receptus. Thus, much of God's word has been left out of their corrupt manuscript. Which words? Most people will never know due to their ignorance and or lack of understanding regarding this very serious issue. The various titles of our Lord Jesus Christ in their critical text have been either eliminated partially or entirely with neither rhyme nor reason. Some of their changes, while not directly affecting doctrine, can minimize the amount of doctrine that supports a doctrine, and also they do change the historical record. Not all translations include all of the following changes made by Westcott and Hort. However, all modern translations do include many of these changes. And I will get into those changes momentarily. But first I want to answer a question that I hear brought up many times. Was the King James Bible written in Old English as some say? Absolutely not. Old English was spoken from approximately 449 A.D. until approximately 1100 A.D. This language was a derivation of the language of the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes that had invaded England in 449 A.D. This language had six vowels as compared to modern English, which has only five vowels. That sixth vowel appeared in the written form as a lowercase e superimposed over a lowercase a. Middle English was spoken from 1100 A.D. until about 1450 A.D. This language began to develop in 1066 A.D. when the Normans invaded England. This language developed when they merged the French language with the Old English language. Modern English, which began to develop around 1450 A.D. and was solidified by the end of the 16th century. In the early 1500s, the daunting and arduous task of major changes in vocal pronunciation, inflection, and spelling was undertaken in order to solidify the modern English language. The final outcome was a language that is still in use today and was also used by the translators to conclude their work which resulted in our King James Bible that we still use today. Now, bottom line is this. I can guarantee you that no one could read nor understand anything that was written or spoken in either Old English or Middle English. I've looked at them. I cannot understand any of it. It is not readable to me. It is absolutely foreign to me to look at. 
in the written form. And in the spoken form, I could not understand what they were saying. However, the modern English that the King James was written in, I can fully understand, comprehend it, and read it. And I'll guarantee you something else. The original English, that the original King James Bible was written, printed in an old font. That makes it difficult to read if you look at it. But if you look at it with a very simple explanation of the spelling and how they use the letter S in the middle of a word, you could read it without any problem at all. So the King James Bible is totally readable today in its original form. The font is not easy to read, but it is read readable. If it were written in Old English, as some claim it was, you would not be able to read it nor understand it. But it wasn't. It was written in modern English. Now I want to share something else with you. They use the terms dynamic equivalence. Dynamic equivalence. The word dynamic basically means a process characterized by constant change, activity, or progress. Constant change, activity, or progress. That's what the word dynamic means, and that's what they claim to use in the modern translations. It's ever-changing. What does the word equivalence mean? Equivalence means a condition of being equal. Well, if it's equal to what's in the King James Bible, why change it? Why change it? Because of copyright law. That's why they want to print a Bible that they can make money on by selling you this Bible that they claim you need to have to understand. It's in it strictly for filthy lucre, for profit. That's all they're after. It is no more readable or understandable than the King James Bible. Now let me share something else. Every time they make changes and copyright a Bible, there has to be significant changes in that Bible to be able to copyright it. So if you change A and make B, B has to be different than A, and if you come up with C, C has to be different than A and B. You are not getting better, you are getting progressively worse progressively worse. They are not making better translations. They are creating progressively worse translations. Bottom line. We have, in the King James Bible, the most accurate Bible we can have in the English language bar none. And you cannot improve on it. Now, let me share something with you that I found interesting. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, Verses 8 through 11. And Saul is sending his servant to talk to the man of God. Verse 8. And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Then there's a parenthesis. Beforehand, in Israel... When a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come, and let us go to the seer, S-E-E-R, the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Parentheses. Do you realize what God just did? He put in the Bible an explanation of what a seer was, because people at that time may not have known the word. And he said, A seer is a prophet. But now let's look what he did. Verse 10. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, Come, let us go. So they went on to the city where the man of God was, and as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water, and said unto them, Is the seer here? Notice, it didn't say prophet. It still said seer. They kept that word. And you will see the word seer used again and again beyond that. Bottom line, God told us in his word that a seer was a prophet. He embedded it in the text, parenthetically. You know what? We would call that today a dictionary. 
You don't need a new translation to understand the Bible. You need a dictionary. And guess what? I'm going to put a little plug in. The Bible for today, the King James Bible, that the Bible for today and the Dean Bergen Society sells, has built into it a dictionary with all of the words you may not understand at the bottom of every single page where that word appears. I don't like places in a book where it tells me a word and down the bottom is a footnote and it says, see page so-and-so, because I only put the explanation in there one time. Now you go look for it back over here. Thank God that they put it at the bottom of every single page where that word appears. You don't have to look anywhere but down to the bottom of the page. You'll see the definition of that word. So you have a Bible, an accurate Bible, a King James Bible with a built-in dictionary embedded in the Bible. Tremendously helpful word of God to help you out. So bottom line, you just need a dictionary. I use a dictionary a lot. But you know what dictionary I use? Noah Webster's 1828 version of the dictionary. Because that dictionary's words and definitions are closest to the King James Bible, so I have a better understanding of what that word meant. Think about the problem of creating a dictionary. Noah Webster set up the first dictionary. Do you know what he did? He took the very best words available to create a dictionary definition of a word. Do you know the dictionary after that couldn't use the best because it was copyrighted? It was already done. So the words they used weren't as good as the words Noah Webster used. It's the same thing with the Bible. The King James Bible is the most accurate English translation that we have. Now I would like to talk a little bit about the Johannine comma, but I'm not going to go into any detail on that because Brother Shepard already did that for us. So I'm going to just very quickly allude to one thing. They claim that in the days when they were translating, and I'm going to go back to Erasmus's Greek text, it did not contain 1 John 5, 7, and his second condition, or edition, did not contain it. But the third and fourth and fifth revisions did contain it, because he said, if you can find me two Greek texts that have it, I'll put it in. And they found them. And he put it in. So the third, fourth, and fifth editions of it did contain it because they proved that it was there. Also, there's a proof in Tatian's Diaturgian, which is a harmony of the four Gospels. And even though he doesn't talk directly about First John in there, he alludes to it. And when he does it, he, he puts in the entire verses of First John 5, 7, and 8. The whole thing is in there. So there are early copies showing it did exist. Bottom line. Now we want to look into some of the changes that the corrupt Westcott and Oort text did. And I'm going to pick up where I left off two years ago. We're in the book of 1 Timothy. And all of these are in my handout that will pass out at the end here. 1 Timothy 1.17 Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. They took out the word wise. I thank God we have not only a God, he's a wise God. But they took the word wise out. Chapter 3, verse 3 of 1 Timothy. Not given to wine, no striker, nor greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. They're talking about ministry gifts here and the ministers. Do you know what he said? Not greedy of filthy lucre. I just saw something on the internet that I purveyed and looked at. It talked about about several dozen of the popular preachers of today, TV evangelists, so spork, that are multi-millionaires. They're greedy of filthy lucre. I couldn't believe some of these men are in very false doctrines. One of them is very close to being a billionaire from preaching the gospel. Many of them, 500, 600 million dollars. Many of them, 300, 400 million dollars. What are they doing? I see them occasionally on TV, flashy white teeth, the whole, you know who I'm talking about, all of this stuff. And what are they doing? 
They're gathering sheep like ravenous wolves, preaching anything that will appease the body, and they're raking in, raking in money hand over fist. Huge congregations, huge buildings, huge corruption of the Word of God, and they're getting money and made rich over it, and they're guilty of filthy lucre. The Bible says you ought not be doing that. Chapter 4, verse 12 of 1 Timothy. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. They took out in spirit. Chapter 5 and verse 4 of 1 Timothy. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. They took out good and. So it's just acceptable before God, but they took out the good. Chapter 6 and verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. They omitted from such withdraw thyself. So that lets us have fellowship with all kinds of ungodliness. But we're told in the Bible, the true Bible, withdraw from them. What happened up here? They withdrew and God blessed them for doing it. Chapter 6 and verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. They took out, and it is certain. They think they can carry it out. I'll tell you something. You can't take it with you, even in traveler's checks. It won't go. It stays here. You've got to lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Chapter 6 and verse 17. Charge them that they that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. They took out the living. You know, some people worship a God that's dead, a God that doesn't even exist. But our God is a living God. He's alive and well. The book of Second Timothy 1.11 Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. That was Paul. They took out of the Gentiles. He was called as a preacher to the Gentiles, the apostle to the Gentiles, but they took that out. The book of Titus, chapter 1 and verse 4. To Titus, mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. They took out mercy. You know, we need grace from God. And we need peace from God. But you know, we also need mercy from God. Because we've all sinned. And it's His mercy that He would even look upon us and do anything for us. It's by the mercy of God. And they took out the word mercy. I thank God for His mercy. I need it every day. The book of Hebrews, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Notice, when he had by himself, they took that out. They took it out. Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior and everything he did he did by himself by the grace of God and with the help of God but he did it himself it took no human help nor intervention for him to do what he did they took out by himself Jesus did it all and it's all to him we owe our salvation and I don't like anything that takes anything away from my Lord and my Savior Jesus Christ he did it himself for us. Chapter 2 and verse 7 of Hebrews. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. And did set him over the work of thy hands. They took out 
and did set him over the work of thy hands. They omitted that from the word of God. Jesus Christ, who died from our sins, was raised by his Father from the dead and made to sit at his own right hand, and he called him God, and he set him in place. And he said, All things are subject unto thee. They took that portion out. Chapter 7 and verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Incidentally, that's another parenthetical verse in the Bible. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. They took out after the order of Melchizedek. And that's an important thing because a prophetic picture of Christ when we understand the work of Melchizedek and what the word has to say about him. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. They took out in their iniquities. They just have sins. Hebrews 10.9 Then said he, Lo, I am come to do thy will, O God. They took out, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Westcott and Hort, by taking out, O God, have misquoted Psalm 40 by omitting the words of God from this verse. This is a direct quote from Psalm 40, and they chose to alter it in their quoting of it. Hebrews 10.30 For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And they took out, saith the Lord. 11.13 These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them. That's faith. They not only saw them, they were persuaded of them. Westcott and Hort took out, were persuaded of them. Hebrews 12.20 For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. Westcott and Hort took out, thrust through with a dart. And again, they misquoted the Bible because they're quoting from Exodus 19, verses 12 and 13, and by omitting those words, they misquote the Old Testament prophecy about what was coming. The book of James, chapter 1 and verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. They took out the words among you. So it makes it look like they're talking about those out there. If any man out there. No, the Bible says if any man among you. That's in the church. That's in the congregation. It's speaking directly to us. And they took that out. Chapter 4 and verse 4 of James. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. They took out ye adulterers and just left adulteresses in there. Now think about that. Doesn't that sort of go back to the Gospels when the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery in the very act and they threw her at Jesus' feet? And said, what are you going to do about this? We caught her in the very act. I ask you a question. Where was the man? If they caught her in the very act, why didn't they bring him too? No wonder Jesus was angry. The hypocrites. And what did Jesus do? He wrote in the sand. And the word wrote there is not mean scribble. I think he was writing times, dates, names, and places. Because they're looking there and they say, oh, he's got my number. And the Bible says they left one by one, beginning with the oldest to the least. How did these men know where to catch people in adultery? They don't do it out in the city street on the corner. They knew where to go. They probably had been there themselves. 
And Jesus showed them who they were, hypocrites. And what does he say here? Ye adulterers and adulteresses, Westcott and Hart leaves adulterers out. Just going after the females. 5.16 Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of righteous men availeth much. What did they do? They changed the word faults to sins. I think the Catholic Church liked that translation because in the Catholic Church you're taught to confess your sins to a priest. The Bible doesn't teach us to say our sins one to another. It's our faults, our shortcomings. You know, when we have issues in our life and we can't seem to get a hold of it, we go to a brother or sister and say, you know, I'm having this problem. Can you help me? I'm not confessing sin to them. I'm looking for help. If I have a fault, a defect, an issue, I can get help from brothers and sisters in the Lord, from my pastor, from my shepherd, whatever, to help me to get on. But I don't confess my sins to them because they can't forgive my sins. Only God can forgive sins. The book of 1 Peter. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. They really took a lot of issues with these two verses. They took out through the Spirit, obeying the truth through the Spirit. They took out through the Spirit. Then they took out pure heart. They took out pure, just heart. And then they ended up with being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth they took out forever they eliminated forever we have a word of God that is forever never to cease never to not be there chapter 4 and verse 1 of 1 Peter for as much then as Christ has suffered for us they took out for us in the flesh arm yourselves likewise with the same mind for thee, he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. They took out for us. Christ suffered not for his own sins. He had none. He suffered for us. Chapter 4 and verse 14 of 1 Peter. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of. But on your part, he is glorified. They took out the whole last portion of that verse. They took out, on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Chapter 5 and verse 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight. They took out taking the oversight thereof. Not by constraint, but willingly. According to God, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. West Conanort added to the word of God because they added the words according to God in that verse, taking out, taking the oversight thereof. Two changes in that verse. Chapter 5 and verses 10 and 11 of 1 Peter. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, after that you had suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. They took out strengthen. In the midst of trials, God will not only establish us, Bring us to perfection in the realm of maturity. That word perfect doesn't mean perfect as we think of perfect. It means mature. He will mature us. We're going to grow up. We're going to be established. And he's going to strengthen you. You will be stronger going through this. They took out that word strengthen. He'll settle you. You'll be settled in your mind. And to him be glory and dominion. They took out glory. All glory goes to God. The book of 2 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but 
Men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In the King James Version and in the original Greek it says holy men of God. But they took that out and changed holy and they changed the word to from. But from men of God, not holy men. Chapter 2 and verse 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Forever. They took out forever. I want to share that the most horrifying thing of hell, I cannot imagine what hell looks like. Jesus spoke quite a bit about hell. And he gave many warnings about hell. And the warnings he's given are dire. We cannot imagine what hell is like. We get a little glimpse of it, of the story that Jesus told about a man that actually died and went into hell. And he sees Lazarus at the bosom of Abraham. You know, Bibles call that a parable. That's not a parable. That truth, That is truth. That happened. He's talking about a real thing. That actually happened because Jesus named people in it. He named Abraham and his bosom and Lazarus and a rich man who died and was in hell. And he said he was in torments, plural. Not torment, singular. Torments, plural. And he wanted if Lazarus would just dip his finger in water and put one drop on his parched tongue, that would have helped him. Think of the misery he was in. Now I want to share something with you about hell. That is absolutely terrifying. It is for eternity. It will never, never, never stop nor cease to exist. There are people that teach annihilation and that people are finally annihilated. They will wish they were, but it will not happen. It seems that God, once he creates a life, that life will never, ever cease to be. It may not live on this earth, but it will live for eternity. Whether with God or apart from God, hell is eternal. It is an eternal lake of fire. And that's one of the reasons we've got to be sharing the word of God with the lost, that they not go to that place. We need to be living epistles and faithful witnesses to witness of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died that people not go there. That's how bad hell is. The God who created hell died that people not go there. He knows how bad it is. And he was willing to die to keep people out of there. That got me off track. Now, Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Oh, I was already here. I want chapter 3, verse 10 of Second Peter. But the day of the Lord, they took out the, will come as a thief in the night, they took out in the night, in the which the heavens that pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up, they change burned up to be discovered. They change the word to discovered. The book of 1 John, chapter 2 and verse 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye have from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. They took out from the beginning. Chapter 3 and verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. They took away our. They took away sins. And in him is no sin. They took away the word our. Chapter 4 and verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. They took out Christ has come in the flesh. They did not like the fact that God became flesh. They were against that and they took it out. He says he's not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Now you know where Westcott and Hort come from. They are from the spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now is already in the world. Don't put Antichrist off to the future. When 1 John was written, 
He said it's already here. That was 2,000 years ago roughly. Chapter 4 and verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. They took out the word him. Chapter 5 verses 7 and 8. I'm not going to go into record on there. We've already talked about that. About the the word in the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's in the Johannine comma. Brother uh, already spoke about that this morning. The book of Jude. Chapter 1 verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified, they change sanctified to loved. Big difference. By God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Chapter 1 and verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They took out the word God from Lord God. Chapter 1 and verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though he once knew this. They changed this to all. How that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. We knew certain things. We don't know all things. Chapter 1 and verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, they changed like manner to manner like. There's a big difference in the wording there. Giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh and set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Chapter 1 and verse 12 of the book of Jude. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you. They took out the words with you. So we see that, again, it looks like we're talking to other people. No, he's talking to the church. Chapter 1 and verse 15. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them. They took out the words among them about their ungodly deeds. Chapter 1 and verse 18. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time he, they said on the last time there's a big difference between the word in and the word on who should walk after their own ungodly lusts chapter 1 and verse 19 these be they who separate themselves they took the word themselves out they just say these be they separate sensual not having the spirit eliminating the word themselves and finally in the book of Jude Chapter 1, verse 25, to the only wise God. Again, they took wise out and just make it to be God. Now, I have several verses in the book of Revelation. I don't have time to get through them, but I want to conclude with this statement on the last page here. A severe warning from God. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy, of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. I want to read that last phrase again. Pay close attention to what he's saying here. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Matthew 1, verses 1 through 17, talks about 42 generations from Adam to Jesus Christ. They are listed in three groups of 14 each. 14 people in each group. Now in my book, 3 times 14 is 42. But in God's book, 3 times 14 is 41. Do you know why? Because of the three groups that are listed, and you can look at them up, 
in Matthew chapter 1, there's 14 men named in the first group, there's 14 men named in the last group, and there's only 13 men named in the middle group. Why? Because a certain king named Jehoiakim had his name omitted from God's book. And therefore, his name does not appear among the list of generations that are recorded in Matthew's Gospel. God took his part out of the book of life, the Bible. It's recorded in the Old Testament what he did, so we would know why. Jeremiah 36, verses 1 to 32, talks about it. It's the eternal record of the wicked actions of this king who dared to rip up and throw into the fire the words of the Lord, a warning to Israel and to Judah given to the prophet Jeremiah by the Lord was totally rejected by this wicked king and he suffered the eternal wrath of the Lord as recorded in the Bible and his name was left out of that list of 42. There is God giving us a record of what happens. And you know, I did a very careful study of the Bible. I cannot find Westcott or Hort's name anywhere in the Bible. Just as an aside. Second Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17. Paul said, We are not of they who corrupt the word of God. And thank you, all the men of the Dean Bergon Society, all the people that support the Dean Bergon Society, we are not of they who corrupt the word of God. God bless you all. Now please stand with me as we read from Psalm 119, starting in verse 81. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? For I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? The proud have digged pits for me, which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. They had almost consumed me upon the earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Quicken me after thy loving kindness. So shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. And the handouts are down here. If someone would like to help pass them out, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Grumma. I appreciate that. All right, while we're passing those out, uh, let's turn to our hymn number 351 this evening. 351 is you all on the altar. 351. DVD, Dr. Ed DeWitt, one of our advisory council members, or I guess an executive committee member, is going to speak on the errors of concept inspiration. The errors of concept inspiration.
Yes, it's really good to, uh, I was going to say to see all of you, but it's good for all of you to see me. I mean, there's so much you can, you know. <laughs> yeah, I used to be fat before I gained all this weight. But enough about me, and really it's not about me, I mean, that's quite obvious. Let's uh, start off with a verse from the scripture. Because even when we're performing a white paper, such as we're doing today in this section, uh, we need to be tied some way to the scripture, because if we're not, all we're given is the words of man, and my words are not all that great, trust me. Romans 123, which shows the problem with concept inspiration, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, into birds and four-feeted beasts and creeping things. Romans 123. May we never divorce our words from the words which God has inspired and preserved for his children. I come before this body one more time than I had expected to do, and both of us ought to be somewhat saddened by that eventuality. I uh, <laughs> Yeah, here again, I am doing my best once again to drive you to prayer. How long is he going to, Lord, how long is he going to talk? That's probably something you're worried about. I do hope to reach my normal level of uh, competency, however. Happily, I've set the bar so low in the past, this time shouldn't be a problem. I was going to drive to this year's DBS meeting. To be honest, the actual reason is I'm not sure this old body would make the trick well. Uh, there's just no way. What was it the poet said about time and tide? As for tide, as far as that's concerned, if I was found lying on a beach somewhere, somewhere, someone would call Greenpeace and try to roll me back into the ocean. As for time, my body consistently rem reminds me I've overstayed my time upon this earth. As for drive, out in the parking lot right out there, I have a 2003 Buick Saber. I'm afraid I might cause a gasoline shortage before I got all the way there. So I doubt I would have to schedule at least three weeks of travel, considering probable repair time. Uh, the real reason I, I, I just can't I didn't drive, I just can't stand all the blurry, blurry horns. It seems everybody distracting to me, but everybody has to honk their horn at least three times in every mile, and I do not understand this. At my age, I'm a very careful driver. I used to babysit Moses when he was a child. I, close, close. I, I always drive the speed limit, you know, 45 miles an hour, printed right up there. Now, sometimes I feel adventurous and push it all the way up to 50, but I'm a very polite driver. And that I am. I, uh, I've studied the situation. It seems nearly everyone drives in the right lane. So I politely drive in the left lane. And knowing that most of the exit ramps are on the right side, I try to remember to keep my turn signal on pointing that direction. I'm, I'm old, so I won't forget and not turn it on when it's time for me to turn. Uh, also, I rarely ever, almost never, use my cell phone. Only when I have to talk to somebody. And I never text at any time on that phone. Partly because I have no idea how to text. Like my grandson said, I better remember to add that. Now this is what I've just done is an example of the outcome of concept inspiration. It really is. I've said things that seem obvious to me at this age. But those things obvious to me might not actually be rooted within the reality of the situation. Another example, and this actually did happen to me, I was visiting a lady in a nursing home, and I'd forgotten to take my cane, so I was a little tired after, after the visit. And somehow I missed the door leading out to the parking lot, couldn't find it. I went up to a nurse and said, how do I get out of this place? I can't find the door. She offered to help. She took my arm and led me to the Alzheimer's ward. Like any adherent of concept inspiration, she had heard what I'd said and processed the information according to her perceived idea of what it should mean. 
Concept inspiration doesn't always concern itself with spiritual truth because the basic idea is to convey the translator's idea of what he might have heard said rather than a strict adherence to what actually was said. By necessity, the translator must do this from his frame of reference in the created world of physicality and time. Unfortunately for this translator's work, God has sent us words of physicality and time to explain the eternal and the spiritual. The translator's focus is so fixated on his audience which resides in the created world that he may overlook the fact that God had intended the audience to actually see and understand the things of eternity and the spiritual. By the way, before I get into my talk much further anyway, I'd like to mention just a few words. Tea Party, Constitution, Freedom, Second Amendment, Freedom of Assembly, Right of Speech, Freedom of Religion. That's probably enough. Now that we have the friendly people from the current administration and the IRS listening in, we can begin. And I suggest you guys from the federal government pay attention. There is a God who actually does control the times and the seasons of the world's governments. We leave our faith completely in his hand. But don't worry about it. Any day now the Lord will appear in the clouds and call his own home to be forever with him. At that time, you and your ultimate spiritual master will be given free reign for a few years. In the meantime, we have more important things to do than to even consider you. <coughs> we have the uh, work of the true master of the universe to proclaim into the world. Now, we honestly do love you. We would never consider doing you harm. True Christians would never consider doing harm to those who are infidels towards our religion. That's just not what the book of God, the holy book of God, expects of us. We pray God acts. Our earnest prayer is that you would accept the free grace of Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior. That's really our only concern towards you. Now, to the issue at hand, the idea of concept inspiration is simply to give a paraphrase of what the paraphraser believes to scripture to true scripture to be. <coughs> yeah, oh, that's done. I guess I can stop. Now, I, I know you got your hopes up to be saying that, but I can't stop yet. I have a few minutes left to fill, and here comes the fuller. First thing to note is that concept inspiration is a slippery slope to doctrinal error. Believe me, I know what error is. I played baseball when I was young. As far as catching the ball in the outfield, right field naturally, uh, the coach kept trying to explain the difference to me between volleyball and baseball. Couldn't get the paper. Now that the idea is what a no, the idea is what a paraphraser believes the sum of his conception to be what is the matter of inspiration. Sadly, as he works from a false scripture that of the critical text of man, even his concepts are flawed. And that seems rather harsh to say. Unfortunately, it's also true. The construct is not as a Reader's Digest book review. The picture of concept inspiration is not of condensation, but of believing that only the general message has been retained and not the words. Problem is, if you take out the words, you're likely to misapply the message. Uh, there are eight notes on a, on a musical scale. I know with flats and sharps and the loop of more notes above and below, there, there are more but I don't really understand or read music all that uh, at all. To be true, I couldn't tell a dough from a buck as to the notes. But potentially, all the notes are encased in those eight notes from the sound of music. Remove those notes and Mr. Beethoven would have been a farmer. Remove the words from the scripture and we have, well, we have simply feelings and aspirations. We could never know what the feelings mean or to what the aspirations would lead. 
concept is a flawed concept, even as, when it isn't repeated twice in the same sentence. In a wonderful book I just read, The Complete Idiot, yeah, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Jewish History and Culture, <coughs> Rabbi Benjamin Black, and I apologize for mispronouncing the rabbi's name, he wrote concerning the Roman destruction of the temple. It took four years from start to finish. But eventually the war was over in 70 in the Common Era. And when the Jews looked at their calendars, they recoiled, recoiled with horror at the realization that the temple went up in flames on the ninth day of the month of, exactly the same day on which their first temple had been destroyed. What does this amazing coincidence mean? Clearly it proved that it was no coincidence. God must have been behind these two great tragedies. Rabbi Black continues with the words of uh, Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook, former chief rabbi of Israel. The temple was only destroyed because of the needless, undeserved hatred between Jews. It could only be rebuilt because of the needless, undeserved love which Jews, well, Jews show their concern for others, even when they differ from them and their values, ideas, and levels of uh, observance. As strange as it may seem, I, a Calvinist, Biblicist, Dispensationalist, Baptist, agree wholeheartedly with the rabbi in that conclusion. That agreement is conditioned on my view of God's great prophecies concerning the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 37, which we understand as the end times tribulation. Do you think the learned rabbi would agree with me in all my conclusions? Yeah, I don't either. Why not? I mean, are we not both speaking from the same understanding of the time of Messiah? I see Messiah as turning the hearts of all Israel to true religion during this, uh, this time of testing. Contributing to our disagreement is the fact that I see Messiah as Jesus. Messiah has already come. He's coming back to the earth to make good on the promises given to Abraham and his descendants. He's coming back to end the time of the Gentiles and restore the sovereignty of the Davidic throne on this earth. I'm fairly certain the rabbi has read the same words which I have read. Our differences in the views of those words. I, I, I'd imagine the rabbi sees these words, the words of the New Testament, as a fantasy of a Gentile world system which is appropriated and greatly changed the great truths which reside in Jewish scripture. Now we understand the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures must stand together. They were written by the same God. Our focus on the prophecies uh, in the Jewish scriptures in the Old Testament is colored by our belief system, and it is, and obviously also the need of the Spirit. Concept inspiration seeks to divorce the needs for the words to fully support the concept. It isn't interested in the actual words. It's only focused upon the general message as understood by the theologian. The theologian, meanwhile, will view the general message only through the glasses of his own theological system of exegesis. In this, we must see the danger of concept inspiration as a prescription for the easy entrance of false doctrine tied to false views of scripture. Now how could this be? Consider, an Armenian theologian, remember Arminius, who came because he hated the doctrine of Calvin so much, he wanted to see uh, free will. Okay, an Armenian theologian may, might fall down a, a set of stairs and break his leg. This would cause him to miss an important series of meetings whose inattention caused him not to give what he saw as needed instruction to others. He worries that his inattention on the stairs has caused him to fail the Lord. A Calvinist theologian, meanwhile, yeah, turned one in the other direction, might fall down the same set of stairs. I'm going to assume he broke his other leg. It would just seem wrong for a champion of free will and an adherent of election to both break the same leg. It is the firm and reasoned belief of the Calvinist that it was the Lord who caused him to fall. That particular fall had been decreed in eternity past. 
It was the Lord who caused him to fail to give needed instruction to others. His worry is understanding why uh, this happened and why God did this to him and what it must mean to his future as a spokesman for the Lord. Words, we see, have real meaning. They don't have the same meaning to all. Whether you live by a creek or a creek depends a lot on where you live. Several years ago, my daughter was going to be baptized in Small Lake near the town where I live. I've been to the lake many, many years before, 30-something. But I did a Google search to refresh my mind on how to get to the lake. My journey began on the interstate highway. Then I turned off to the hard road. The hard road became a gravel road. The gravel road quickly became a two-lane dirt road. That ended in a cornfield with no lake in sight. She Google had did it oops. A farmer, and whose drive I had to turn around, said, Near as I figured, Google must have shot satellite maps during harvest season, but I'd taken down a few rows of corn and mistaken that for a road. But you can't get to the lake from here. Apparently, I had not been the only outsider to attempt to find the lake by Google search. Probably should have used a good map from the state. But anyway, along this vein, some very intelligent scholars have decided that they know enough about the eternal and spiritual that they can understand the general concept of scripture in those areas. Uh, well, I'm certain they're correct. I don't doubt they're correct. I mean, just consider how much power and influence the church has into the world of men since these scholars begin to exalt their own knowledge. Who needs the leading of the actual word which God has placed in Scripture? Well, unless I want to end up in a spiritual cornfield which keeps me from finding the lake of living water, so I guess I do. You ever try to put together a new toy for your grandkids without reading the instructions? <laughs> yeah, if the toy is a new computer, you better get those grandchildren to help. They live in a computer world. They understand the beast of binary blustery. Now, I didn't try to consult with, Doc, with Mr. Spock on this, but I do find it illogical to believe that any man of physicality and time would understand the reality of eternity and spirit well enough to reconstitute a lost scripture without being able to use those words which God gave to explain the land of hereafter to the people of here. Eternity and the spiritual are a strange country to our human eyes and ears. We can hear nothing, we can see nothing of that land. It's all conjecture. Just look at some of the fanciful attempts of so many down through the ages to explain the concept of an afterlife. We must have the real words of the real God given in his real miracle book to understand the eternal and the spiritual. Jesus told Nicodemus, If I told you the earthly things and you believe not, how can you believe by telling heavenly things? John 3.12 In the very next verse, Jesus explained the need for an experiential understanding of heavenly things. These need to be explained to those of us, all of us, whose, whose entire life experience is on the earth. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Even the Son of Man which is in heaven. By the way, if you simply follow the words of that sentence, you must agree that Jesus is God. He speaks of himself as being on earth and in heaven at the same instant. One who considers the concept, not the words of the scriptural message, is like one trying to find a specific lake without a map. It might well end up in a cornfield. I remember back in the misty old days when I took my test to get my first driver's license. They made me bring my own horse and buggy. But anyways, one portion of the test had a series of, of shapes. These are the shapes of the different signs, I was told. Your job was to tell us what should be written on each sign. Yeah. How do I know? Show me the sign, I'll read the message on it. What's, what's written there? That was my plea. If one doesn't know what is written on the sign, how can one understand that to which the sign is pointing? If the words are discarded for the preservation-inspired word, 
how can one understand what is the message of that version? My grandson, for instance, asked me to go outside and play catch with him. I pretty well understood what he said. I got his message. But if I go outside with a football and he's brought his baseball glove, it's obvious we both have not gotten the same message. Those words are signposts to explain the meaning of that message. Remove the words and the message is anything one might wish it to be. And that's true even when the person's wrong. Concept inspiration has been described as a slippery slope to doctrinal error. I would now consider that concept inspiration is a slippery slope to the event of exegesis. Oh, look. He uses a little red outline. Look at the last three points. Yep, I do. When my father built the house I grew up in, I grew out much later, uh, but that's another story. Anyway, he built the house with a gas furnace. He also put in a coal chute. Many years later, I asked him why he built it that way. His answer? That's the way my dad taught me to build a house. That's the way I build a house. So, three alliterated points. That's the way I was taught. That's the way I do it. Problem is, I do it really poorly. Okay, the men in exegesis. Back to the rabbi's book one more time. The trees, it is said, came before God to complain about the ways of his creation. Why, they ask him, did you create us at the very same time allow the creation of an axe that would be used to chop us down and destroy us? You foolish trees, answered God, have you never noticed the axe has a wooden handle? If you would not have first given of yourselves to the enemy, it will be incapable of ever doing you any harm. Just as an aside, have you noticed that I have access to the same book which has no relevance to the issue at hand, as far as this talk is concerned? Why? Because I've recently read this book, a very interesting, well-written book, and the reading has allowed it to become a natural part of my thought process to the extent that I will relate certain stories from that book to use as arguments in favor of my thesis. We need to read our Bibles much more often, even than the best of us do. It's a very good book. It contains some very interesting things within its covers. A serious perusal of the Bible will allow its precepts to become part of our thought processes. This to the point that they will just crop up in our general conversation. Reading the inspired and preserved words of God is a very good witnessing to it. And now back to our regularly sponsored convention. Folks, if you want to understand the lack of power of the church in this nation, go back to the concept of concept inspiration. From this, or possibly vice versa, came the uh, reversal of the church's use of the verbal plenary understanding of Scripture. I say possibly vice versa, uh, in recognition that those who placed unholy hands upon the holy words of God's inspired and preserved scripture had to find an excuse for their actions in explaining away their operation upon the ver verity of scripture with the diagnosis they were only in their opinion operating on the corpse. What better way to destroy the faith of the people in the pew and to enhance one's own prestige and power than for a Bible college to explain that the words were no longer in the house in the book. Only those with a spatial knowledge can then rightly understand the message of God. And you foolish people thought that Gnosticism had died out centuries ago. Yeah, yeah why, why do you think we were being fed a diet of Gnostic text for our spiritual food? Satan understands that we cannot be defeated when we stand in the Spirit. Well, we're told that we no longer have a need or trust for the guidance of the Spirit of God or the words of God. After all, we can't really trust either, can we? Yeah, you better believe we can't. That's why these meetings are taking place. It's a very short view to say we're simply we simply stand for the underlying text of the King James Bible. Folks, we stand against Satan and all his nefarious wiles. And we can never do that without the power of the Spirit and the words of the inspired and preserved scripture. When I went to war, I was issued a gas mask, a black jacket, and a rifle. It would have been foolish to just invite the enemy over to talk with us. You know, we're going to learn your language, and we're going to play some of your favorite records, favorite songs, all that kind of thing. 
We could have called it a contemporary war. And then had a traditional war, you know, at a later time. Isn't that what we're doing in our churches of this day? Where did our power as a church go in this day? It didn't go anywhere. We just learned not to trust it. Instead, we become very friendly with the foe. We have a new thing in the law right now. It's called hate crimes. Now, very few crimes are committed by those who love their victims. Why are Christians not up in arms into the world of those who disagree with us and defeat our Savior? You know, we might well dislike, but we're not of the people who hate. I heard that a man named McVeigh blew up a building some years ago. Another man, actually several, attacked a couple of abortion clinics. Another man, pretty well, pretty well we're out of examples of Christian hate. I'd appreciate if someone would give me examples of these people seeking to win the loss to Christ. Where is the evidence that these men were Christians within their lifestyles? In the gospel movie, A Distant Thunder, one young lady turns in her friends for being Christians during the tribulation era. Now, I can't quote exactly, but she saw some of those friends facing the guillotine. The friends were shocked to see her there. They said they thought she was a Christian. Oh, silly, she said. Anyone can say they're a Christian. Read the book of James. Were any of these Christian terrorists actually Christian? Show me the fruits of the Spirit in their lives. I see no evidence, no reason to call them Christian. The only pur purpose of calling these persons Christians is to paint the true Christian with the broad brush of intolerance. Now there's an obvious hate crime. We can ac access the example of those people who protest the funerals of people with whom they disagree. I've been at my town twice. I don't remember any of them bringing a witness to anyone about their soul. I wouldn't count them as a Christian group based on the lack of the fruit of the Spirit in their national excuse me, national I wanted to talk into that. I would not count any of them as a Christian group based on the lack of the fruit of the Spirit in their national outreach program. Oh God get us that. Folks, when we see the national media, late night topics, and other religions seeking to lay the axe to the root of our tree of Christianity, just remember we've given them the wood for the handle of that axe. We've done this by inviting the world's music into our praise of the Lord. We've done this by inviting the world to pass judgment upon our scripture. If they don't want to read it, we don't want to use it. We've done this by inviting the culture of the world into our church service. We've done this by bringing a polite speech to the pulpits, which never warns of sin and hell. Someone read a reference for me to the verse where Jesus said, All of you are fine. We're just like you, you're just like us. Come on over and join us. You have nothing to lose or fear. I offer religion without commitment, piety without pain and heaven will remain earthly. Then we offer a baptism of immersion into the cesspool of Satan's world and culture. Sad. False. Popular. In the interest of spreading the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, some of these have been known to offer a Lord's Supper of beer and pretzels. What version did this come from? I am certain it came from no version which had anything to do with the real words of real scripture. And our good Gnosti, groveling to the demands of the world leadership, applauds our effort to win the lost without the cross. All this began with laying down the sword of the Spirit and accepting the sweet leadership of the world of Satan's lie. The words of God remain perfect and powerful. The Spirit remains to witness of the way of God, the truth of Scripture, and the life which Christ from the cross has called us to live in this world. As a dispensationalist, I believe in the overriding purpose of human history is to display the glory and purity of God to this world. Even this is useful to humanity 
but we're able to see our imperfections vividly contrasted with the perfection which is God. To any reasonable person, this is reason enough to fall to our knees and accept the free grace which God has offered to each of us. Sadly, but truthfully, concept inspiration is also a slippery slope to downgrading the eternal one. Can't work, of course, but the finite minds of the people in this world all always seek to enlarge themselves into something of importance. Yeah, foolish people. Seems they'll never understand that this world is only a short way station on the road to eternity. That reality is constantly ignored by those whose hearts and minds are darkened by the wiles of Satan and the words of his willing tools in the land of human intelligence. Major problem with concept inspiration is that it does tend to insult, exalt the knowledge of man, even as it seeks to give a modern understanding of the ancient scriptures. The consequence of this mindset is that the message of God is lost in a cross-cultural attempt to make the old words of God reach the new man of this earth. Now Solomon was a pretty wise man. I know that he said that the matter was pretty wise. And as I'll quote from Ecclesiastes, I must also consider that this is a book of the wisdom of man displayed on the canvas of God's preserved word. This is a true statement as concerns humanity. The thing which hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. Now I understand many things have changed at the time of Solomon. He never had to put gas in his chariot so he could travel around his kingdom. He didn't even have to plug his chariot into any outlet to charge it up. He didn't have to feed his chargers oats so they could continue, continue the trip. But Solomon wasn't talking about inventions. He was talking, his subject matter was about the essential nature of man. Man has not changed in the 3,000 or so years since Solomon. Man was created with a desire to worship. When he cannot find the true God to worship, he'll find something else. To be honest, man is always willing to find something else to worship rather than the God who created him. This is so until the time when the Spirit sends conviction to that man's heart. And by the way, we're to witness that need to the population of the world. We're also to pray by name whenever possible for the Spirit to send this conviction upon a man's heart. With Solomon, I would assume part of his, assume part of his worship was centered upon women. There was more. Wealth and prestige must have also figured into Solomon's manology of worship. I would also assume that Solomon came back to God, the God of his father, at some point late in his life. Isn't that the gist of uh, Proverbs 22 6? Train up a child the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. God is so good to answer the prayers of parents, even after they have long since graduated to glory. The point is there's no need to update the eternal words of God for a new age of man. God knew all about everything that happened and will happen on this earth. He spoke his words from that eternal perspective which will touch the souls of men and women, the boys and girls, at any age. We do God a profound disservice when we argue that his words were so buried within his creation. Uh, they lost their power sometime during a hippie celebration in 1968. Do the learned theologians of the day not realize that God is wiser and more powerful than all? God has no letters after his name. There's nothing that speaks more of power, prestige, and purpose than the name of God. Not needed. The mania to exalt man has led proponents of concept inspiration to depart from the obvious will of God, and this extent extends to worship. Paul made an interesting plea at Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You notice that? Paul speaks of singing spiritual songs with grace in our hearts, if the singer can simply substitute the name of Jesus 
It was the name of Jesse. And then take the same song to any tavern and sing it to the patrons. Is that a spiritual song? Would the melody of the spiritual song simply substitute a few pious words and be unrecognizable from any sensual song in the top 40 of the radio? Watch the performers at these praise services. Look at the vacant look on their faces. Look at the gyrations of the stage. Is this any different than that which can be found in any music hall in the world? But we're told we need to do this to reach the people of the day. Do we? To what are we calling them? From what are we calling them? As to the performers in the mosh pit that formerly served as a church sanctuary, as they swing, sway, and swoon, they're in a very precarious, precarious situation, whether they understand it or not. They will test their inner spirit, and they may well be, as they move into a state of submission to the sensual drives of the music and the loving words which claim the spirituality, they open themselves to the spirit of the age. That's the beat. That's the content. That's the situation in which they find themselves. They do not understand under the soul loving effects of the ecstasy of the moment that they're prime candidates for spiritual op uh, upper oppression. The words may well have some claim on spirituality. Everything else also claims the spirituality of the world. Beyond this, they have no real defense. Jesus gave the example of using scripture to combat the temptations of Satan in the fourth chapter of Matthew. With the concept of concept inspiration, removing the words from the message, these people are spiritually defenseless. The culture, entertainment, hopes, aspirations, everything about the Christian should be different from the world. We cannot exalt the God, the pure God of eternity, by wallowing in the culture of the impure God of this present world system. What has been done is to belittle the message of God and the God of that message. We've told them that his words can no longer reach the crowd of this age. We claim to a need to join the Philistines so we can fight for Israel. We said earlier that humanity is of the natural creation of physicality of time. We can never understand the things of the spirit in eternity without finding a guidebook to teach us the truths of that land. I have spoken much about the cultural revolts of Bibles, small case intended, which are based in the concept of concept inspiration. That's because these Bibles, which have removed the very words of God from consideration, have left only the temporal words of man. Even the concepts drawn from this may not be considerations of anything God may have to relate to the spirit of his children on the earth. It's to be expected that this concept of the Bible's called for this rationale will convey the culture of the spirit of the age rather than the spirit of God. Remember the first school I attended after my high school graduation? It was a Bible college. Proudly so. We were to give a little handouts explaining why we were superior to the other mere colleges in the secular world. But now they're a university. They probably proclaimed this as a great advancement for the institution. Back then they would have called it a large step backwards spiritually. I digress. One of the first professors I set under made the statement at that school that communism is superior, a superior system for many people. What would that book I accessed earlier have to say about that? Isaac Jacob Rabinowitz, a renowned Hamidic scholar, said, Marxism is contrary to Torah, which protects private property. Point is, if a teacher at a Baptist Bible college couldn't even understand the concepts of this earth, how can we expect that scholar to lead us once the words of scripture have been plowed under by the cultivator of human intellect? Folks, it's quite easy to explain inspiration. It's plenary. That means complete and perfect. It's capable of error. It is verbal. That means every single word and letter, even the parts of the letters, according to Jesus in Matthew 5.18, are perfect 
and eternal. It is the breath of God. It is the words of God communicated, communicated to us down to this day because the eternal word of God is what it is. Just the concept doesn't make it. That may give an incomplete or an interpreted through the eyes of a theological scholar a false view of what God has said. I remember when Ronald Reagan was running for re-election. He uh, was doing poorly at the polls. His advisors realized they were guilty of micromanaging his uh, campaign. They decided to just let Reagan be Reagan. Yeah, he wanted a landslide. Folks, look around you. We live in a day where the great revivals of the past are simply a fond memory. We don't see the power of the Spirit evidence in most of the churches of the land. We're trying every trick that man can devise to help God out of his no public relations love. Too many of us have confused the church hall with the dance halls. Go into any city six weeks after a great city ride revival. Look around the beer halls, the taverns, the movie theaters, the people of the city, and see if you're finding the evidence of the faith of God. Generally speaking, there will be none. A true revival is more of the Spirit of God. Of uh, that it is upon the people of God but it's the spirit upon those people that produces the revival they become sponges soaked in the water of the spirit they just cannot help leaving a little of that water wherever they might walk there are changes in the general population of that area as the spirit of God moves through the people of God now look at the church after their annual spring revival yeah, let's not comment too much on that. We get hurt feelings for the people in the pew. The pew is simply viewed by most as a place to sit and feel useful. It really finds use for the message and outreach of God. But why is all this happening? It's because we departed from the words of the message which God has inspired and reserved for his people. Our best efforts are not doing the job. Isn't there time we just let God be God? Agrees in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's really good to... Please stand for the reading of God's word. We are in the 119th Psalm, one of my very favorite portions of that psalm, starting in verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for all are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection but thy commandment is exceeding broad. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, let's uh, turn our hymnals to number 274. 274, please. I belong to the king.
let you know if you're if you're thirsty and you need some, some water. Right back in the back, there's some water back there. Uh, some five-gallon jug in the narthex, the vestibule. So go ahead and take care of that. Questions at bftbc.org. If you want to write us, 856, 85, rather, uh, BFC at uh, questions at BFT, BFC, BFC .org. Questions at bftbc.org. Get it in a minute there. All right. That's our email for questions. We heard from Patty Cantor. Uh, she wrote, did, did West Garden Hort make additional changes when making the West Garden Hort text? They went beyond what was already changed in the corrupted manuscript that they used. Also, I noticed that the NASB has many, many changes in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament and the King James Bible, when I compared them years ago, it was surprising how many there were and what I looked at and compared. Patty Cantor from Pennsylvania. Yes, I'm sure they took many extra Westcott North changes in the Greek, even beyond what they did there. And then we heard from Robert Robinson from Albuquerque, New Mexico. A greetings to you and all attendants in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm watching the video feed via the YouTube this year. I hope everyone is enjoying the speakers as much as I am. It's a tremendous blessing to tune in every year. And thank you for taking a stand for the traditional text of our King James Bible. Take care of yourselves. You're all still in my prayers. God bless you. I will see you again soon, there or in the air. Robert Robinson. All right, uh, we have the next speaker for us, uh, one of the members of our uh, executive committee of the Dean Bergen Society, Dr. D.L. Cooper. And he's going to be speaking to us on the subject, Look at the Accursed Tree and See, from Marietta, Georgia. And he's going to be our host for next year. Right, Doctor? Okay. Dr. Cooper. Right ahead. I'd like to say something in regard to Brother uh, Rainey's message last night regarding the kerosene jug. Uh, being from Tennessee initially, we, we had some of our, own, our remedies too. They were, in a, they were in a glass jug and a cork. We made them. I, see, I come from a long line of uh, chemical engineers. And um, so ours is a little different, but it, I, I'm sure the remedies worked about the same. And then I would like to say thank you to Dr. Spencer and, and the church, uh, Bible Presbyterian Church, for allowing us to be here. What gracious hosts they've been. And uh, it's such a blessing to be here. And and to be in this famous pulpit, as Dr. DeVitro said. Uh, he said he'd been in two, I believe. Um, I used to let him come and preach at my church, but um, not now. No, I do appreciate the privilege of being here and being associated with Dean Bergon. Uh, if you would turn with me, please, to uh, a couple of passages of Scripture. Just to get started, and if you would stand, if you're able to stand, would you stand with me please while we read these verses? 1 Corinthians 1, 17, and then Galatians 3, 13, and Philippians 2, 8. 1 Corinthians 1, 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And now in, in Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 13, very well known portion of scripture, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And then in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Would you pray with me please? Our Father in heaven, we come to you now, Lord, with one purpose in mind. 
and that's to worship Thee. Father, we realize our great responsibility that we have before You to serve You with reverence and godly fear. And we would ask You, Heavenly Father, that You bless the reading from Your precious Word. And Lord, we do understand that this Bible that we have in our hands has come to us through the, through the blood of the martyrs. Many have given their lives that we could have this word. Help us, Lord, to defend it. Help us to, to abide by it and live for you. And Father, I would ask you for this feeble preacher that you'd so fill me to the uttermost and use these words for your honor and for your glory. For we pray in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. You can be seated. What a blessing it is for me to be associated with the Dean Bergon Society. And each year we, we meet uh, to affirm the underlying text of the King James Bible, understanding that as we meet, it defends itself, does it not? However, it is important that we defend our position of the received text, knowing that these great doctrines of our Christian faith contained in the Word of God are constantly under attack. And we, we would expect nothing less than a full assault from the world as well as the cults and false religions. But as we face this great cultural shift in America, in our country, and of course, unfortunately, in our churches, we're aware that these attacks are coming from within the supposed scholarship and leadership of the church. And when the desire to be politically correct and to make Jesus and the gospel relevant and palatable to, palatable to everyone, we have a multiplicity of Bible versions leading many Christians into doctrinal error, deceiving the lost and leading them away from a genuine faith in Christ. The Word of God asks the question, Psalm 11.3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And then, of course, in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation stone. By the way, not a capstone, was it? A foundation stone, a tried stone, precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and he that believeth shall not make haste. In our modern culture, we... Uh, there seems to be no foundation substantial enough to satisfy human reasoning and the attacks on our traditional texts. And the only thing that is absolute is that there are no absolutes when it comes to these Bible translations. There's no place where this is more clearly evident than within the church. And let me add in the Christian bookstores. You know one of the most dangerous places for a young Christian is a Christian bookstore? Amen. It's more, no, nowhere is it more evident than our, within the church and, it's, and then see it in its current lack of acceptance of the, of the solid scriptural foundation for what constitutes the Word of God. There's so much question. But when we fail to use as a basis for our theology and doctrine and inspiration and preservation of the scripture, then the consequence is the crumbling and ultimate collapse of the foundation of our Christian beliefs. It's amazing in our area we have we have the through the church they bring they bring the small groups in with the uh, with with the, with the uh, believing Christians and they, they're mixed up and they don't know. Now, I'm not opposed to small groups, but I'm just simply saying they bring the world in with them and they get mixed up. They learn the phraseology, they learn they learn the techniques, they learn when to say amen, they learn when to when to do this, when to do the other thing, and we see a collapse within the church of our Christian beliefs. But once and all of this is based on the uh, the problem of giving us different versions of the Scripture and trying to alter the Word of God. But once the die of doubt is cast upon the purity and the preservation of the underlying text that's given by inspiration of God, then the next, 
natural step of the textual critic, critic is to continue chipping away at the foundational doctrines of the church of which Christ purchased with his own blood. And if by the logic of the textual critics, the inspiration and the accuracy and the infallibility of the received text can be destroyed, then the foundation upon which Bible-believing Christians base their faith, and those foundational doctrines presented and preserved in our King James Bible, then, then can be denied. If this cloud of uncertainty from the critics overshadowing the inspiration and preservation of the Word of God is uh, preservation of the Word of God, we we now have a generation, or with this cloud of, of, of uncertainty, we have this we have a generation of preachers and a blossoming, blossoming group of young men entering, entering the ministry who are not fully persuaded of the purity the preservation and the power of God as originally given by divine inspiration. With this reluctancy to accept the accuracy and sufficiency of our King James Bible, they set out to penknife the Word of God, the Word and the words of God, attempting to produce a version of Scripture that is less offensive and more culturally relevant resulting in a man-centered book devoid of the power to convict and convert the soul. If we, therefore, come face to face with the understanding that there exist not many religions in the world and many ways to lead, uh, that lead to God, and it doesn't matter which way you choose, one chooses, but rather there are only two religions. Paganism and Christianity, and this uh, and it does matter which one one would choose. This raging battle with either perverted versions or paganistic self-designated holy books, such as the Book of Mormon or uh, the New World Translation and the Quran, and the mass marketed perversions that, that strike at the very heart of the King James Bible and its underlying and supporting text for which we stand. Not only do these groups hate Christians, I believe, they despise the one true and living God and His book. There are people that hate our book, our Bible, people that hate this King James Bible. And while there are those who purport to be Christian but deny it with their perverted text they present to the, and present, present to the world and the church a man-centered book with a Christless redemption and a works-based salvation. These textual critics give the idea that they're holding to the Scripture and saying that they believe that Jesus is God. While, it's, while attacking his deity with their, re, with their revisions and rewording of the word of God that we know. And in doing so, they deny the sonship of Christ, undermining the necessity of this and sufficiency of the cross of Christ. And if he's, if he's not God, the cross is unnecessary and is made of none effect. And folks, if Jesus is not God, all of this today is a sham. And we're wasting our time. Here's, here's where we can begin seeing that the cults and paganism are supported by this plethora of versions that are forced upon an unsuspecting world and therefore causing great perversions in our fundamental truth, the fundamental truths of our faith. And this presents a great challenge to the church in having a proper understanding of who God is, who Jesus is, in, in relation to paganism, especially when dealing with, with Mormons and the JWs who deny that Jesus is God and they deny the resurrection. Then you have the Muslims who, uh, who deny that Jesus is the Son of God and that the crucifixion and the death of Christ ever took place. And with, we, we have within the supposed 
scholarship, those who have penknifed the Word of God, stripping it of its inspiration and authority, giving paganism a clear road to deception, not only to corrupt the church, but also to present the unsuspecting, unconverting world, unconverted world a direct, continued path to destruction and doom. You see, I believe that with all of these versions, all these perversions of the Scripture, I believe they're playing right in the hands of the cults and the pagans. They, these these new versions all seem to be trying to project an image of Jesus, who is, as I said, palatable uh, to a Christ-rejecting world. You'll never ex- expect the, the Christ rejectors of the world to accept the Jesus that we know and love. We never accept the Word of God that we love unless the Holy Ghost deals with them, pricks their hearts, and touches them. Now there's an example. We, someone had mentioned, I think yesterday, regarding the new, the new King James. While these revisions, the revisions of the new King James say, well, we're just changing the these and the thous, uh, to modernize the text and to make it more readable. It looks, uh, let's look at just a few of the instances, and some of these have already been mentioned either today or yesterday, as they make an attempt to make our, the Bible, the Word of God, more readable and more acceptable. They omit the word Lord 66 times. God is omitted 52 times. Heaven is omitted 48 times. Repent is is omitted 11 times, and the blood omitted 11, uh, 18 times, and hell is omitted 22 times. You know, we never hear messages on hell anymore, do we? Uh, the, the only time the church people anymore ever hear about hell is if somebody outside tells them to go there. They never hear a message on hell anymore. But then also the word devils is omitted, which is 55 times in the, in the King James Bible, is omitted. And damnation and Jehovah and the New, and New Testament, the phrase New Testament, are completely omitted. If we accept Jesus, if we accept the Jesus presented in these many versions of the Bible that leave out the deity of Christ and the atoning death, His atoning death on the cross, then we have just another book. For instance, if while Islam may have a big view of Jesus within the Islamic paganistic framework as a prophet or a forerunner of Muhammad, they deny the crucifixion of Christ, some even teaching that it was Judas or one of Jesus' followers that actually died on the cross in his stead. You see, that says that Jesus needed the substitute, didn't it? This, this would give the substitute, by the way, an automatic entrance into heaven. Now how can we ever, how can we ever challenge the paganistic Islamic error of the Quran that completely denies Jesus to be the Son of God and believing that God impregnated, impregnated Mary and the Trinity is compiled of God, Mary, and Jesus? How can we ever confront them if we don't have the Word of God? How can we challenge with a book that, that some call the Bible that is revised every year and a half this paganistic and man-centered teaching of the holy book of the Muslim religion that has not been changed or revised for centuries? Is it not s- strange that the Mormon cult Within the Mormon cult, there is not a revision of the Book of Mormon every two years. Is it not strange that the Quran is not updated every year and a half? A devout Muslim, I understand, would never accept nor read an updated version of the Quran. But yet we fall right into the trap and take anything that comes down the pipeline that says it's the Word of God. Is it not strange that when our favorite Christian TV evangelist or preacher publishes a new study Bible, that we, we readily accept it even when the study notes demean and correct our King James Bible? 
When the Bible revisionists run to the Westcott and Hort and other of the corrupted text to correct or alter our King James Bible, they fall right into the hands of the of the Mormons, the JWs, the Muslims, and and a Christ and a re, uh, in rejecting Christ's death and his burial and his resurrection. This great corruption of the Scripture presents a wrong view of who Jesus is and the importance of the cross, the cross work for salvation. Combining the corrupt, Christ-denying text of Westcott and Hort with the paganistic teachings of groups such as the the Jehovah's False Witnesses and the Muslims, you brew up a toxic, Bible-hating, Christ-rejecting soup assured to doom the souls of men. And this is being served on the tables of churches across our land. The essential importance of the cross presented in the Old Testament and then it's re- un- foretold by Jesus is fully revealed in the New Testament, but destroying the identity and deity of Christ would make the cross unnecessary and powerless, and diminishing the death of our Savior. For the Jehovah's Witnesses and for the Mormons, if Jesus is not God, it doesn't matter if he rose from the grave. I tell them, you know, you would think that after a while, when they come to, they knock on the door of a, of the house of a Baptist preacher, they would get the point once in a while. When you tell them, until you tell me that you believe that Jesus is God, it doesn't matter if he rose from the grave or not. Until we can agree at that point, we can't go any further. But they still leave their literature, they still come. And for the Muslims, since Jesus was just a prophet and less than Muhammad, then Jesus dying on the cross did not happen. But rather, Judas or another substitute was secretly put on the cross and accomplished nothing by his death. The idea of Jesus dying on the cross is in Islam just a fabrication. By analysis then, robbing Jesus of his deity and his sonship, whether by paganistic denial or by the cultic acceptance of corrupted manuscripts, the same goal of salvation by works and the glorification of man is accomplished. You realize that when these different versions take the deity of Christ and the sonship of Christ out, they begin somewhere to elevate man. And the word of God, I believe, from Genesis to Revelation would abase the pride of man. So we see in these verses that we, we read, 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18, Galatians 3 and 13, Philippians 2 and 8, we see, we read how important the cross is. What is it then that we see when we look at this cross? The accursed tree. That the pagans and the Bible rejectors and the textual critics fail to see and ever accept. As we read, first of all, I would say to you that they fail to see and to accept the inspiration of the Scripture that is declared by the Word of God itself. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, unto all good works. So they, first of all, they fail to see the inspiration of the Scripture. Secondly, they fail to see that the Scripture can perfect and equip the man of God and the church. We have people, they call us and they say, well, what do you have for the children? We have the Bible. Well, it didn't want that. We want programs. There's nothing wrong with having things for kids to do. But folks... We have to have the, we have to pump them with the Bible, give them the Bible. So they fail to see if the Word of God, the Scripture, can perfect and equip the man of God and the church. Then thirdly, they fail to see and accept that by destroying the inspiration and preservation of the Word of God in its original text, 
and the sonship and deity of Christ, they are destroying the fundamental truths of the gospel of Christ. When that's destroyed, we have nothing to preach. In Acts chapter 5, if you remember, in verse 30, the apostle Peter addressed the high priest and the Sanhedrin saying this. He says, the God of our, of the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. The crucifixion did take place. Jesus did die on the cross. Then Paul, as, as we read in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth upon the tree. And of course, I read, read again, Paul said again in Philippians 2, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and been found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The death of the cross. Then again we see that Paul declared in 1 Corinthians 1.17, he said, he said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. When a group would take the, the deity of Christ away, alter the word of God to where, God, where Jesus is just mere man, they're destroying the whole concept of the, of the crucifixion of Christ and the work of Christ on the cross when they destroy his sonship. So I want us to turn to one other passage of Scripture and look at some things here for just a moment, if you would, in 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 21. Speaking of Christ as an example of suffering, <clears throat> for us when we would suffer now ladies this does not mean that you are suffering for Jesus when your husband you know, with, with your husband okay <laughs> but I want us to look at Jesus as being our example but then it tells us some things about Jesus as well for, uh, for some other things verse 21 of Second of 1 Peter chapter 2 he said for even here in 2 ye were called Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Verse 24, who bear, uh, uh, who in his who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. When I look at the accursed tree, when we take the word of God and, and the doctrine of the gospel and God's plan of salvation from eternity past, what do we see when we look at that accursed tree? That the cults, the Muslims, the JWs, and, and the Mormons, all of these do not see. Now, people will say to you, I believe the Mormons believe in the crucifixion. They don't. Listen, their, their doctrine is so warped, it takes away from anything that the scripture would say. But what do we see when we, when we look at this accursed tree and see what God says about the cross and Christ's death on that cross. In verse 21, uh, verse 24, notice with me first. He says, speaking of Jesus, who his own self, who his own self bear our sins. When we look at the accursed tree, we see the body of Christ. In this verse, uh, it says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. When we look at the cross of Christ, when we look at this accursed tree, we see first the body of Christ. This is 
This is the body of the God-man hanging on that cross for you and for me. It doesn't matter what, what the revisionist would do to take out the deity. It doesn't matter those that would question even if the, if the Calvary even took place. When we, as God's people, and when, we, when the Holy Ghost deals with the heart, He looks at the accursed tree and He sees there's the body of God dying there, the body of, of God incarnate in flesh dying there. His own body is what I see. But then we notice also in verse 24, not only the, the body of Christ, but we see the burden of Christ. For our sins. Folks, do you realize what happened that day on Calvary? That God took your sins and my sins upon Himself and bore them to that accursed tree and bought redemption for all of those who would believe. Bought the re- Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was wounded... For our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We see his burden. John it was that said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Would you please turn back to, uh, turn to Colossians chapter 2 for just a moment. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. You know the verses well. And you, being dead in your sins... And the sons and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. You see, my past is gone, hallelujah. If you knew, knew me before I was saved, you wouldn't want to talk to me. If you knew me before I was saved, you wouldn't want to hear me. But thank God my past with all of its sin and all of its shame is gone. Hallelujah. Can you say that here? Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> we see the body of Christ when we look at the accursed tree. We see the burden of Christ, which is our sins. But also in verse 24, notice... We see the bleeding of Christ. He says that by His stripes we are healed. By His stripes. And I think of that terrible day when, when He had to pay for my sins. Here's a little urchin from the hills of Tennessee that knew nothing about God. Never taken to church. But I had a mom that set me down. She couldn't, she couldn't get to church, but she set me down with a Bible and told me the old, old story about Jesus and His love for me. And told me, son, this is the way to heaven through Jesus Christ. I just buried my mom the, first, the, the sixth day of June. I was able to preach her sermon from her Bible that she first told me about Jesus from. The folks, I rejoice to know that just a few days before my mom went to heaven, I said, Mom, she had a little dementia. I said, Are you, did you ever get saved? <laughs> she said, Oh, yes, son, I got saved. I said, Can you tell me where you got saved? And she said, I got saved at the, at the, at the, uh, Beverly Baptist Church in Beverly Station, Tennessee. I said, did you ever get baptized then? Oh, yes, I got baptized. She said, I got baptized in the Beaver Creek in Powell, Tennessee. And I was sitting on the bank that day, and I watched that. But she took, we went home, and then she began to tell me about Jesus as just a little lad. She told me about Jesus. But folks, I'm going to tell you, when I look at the cross, I see His bleeding. His blood poured out for me. Poured out for me an unworthy, ungodly sinner that had no hope within. But by His sovereign grace, He called me and made me one of His own. Praise the Lord. 
having made peace through the blood of His cross, <laughs> by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Remember, Leviticus said this. The book of Leviticus records, For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. As he was bleeding there that day, he was pouring out his life for me. He was pouring out his life for you. All of these years, I've watched people in the ministry and, 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 and people that I've talked to and witnessed to, and some say, oh, you'll never get me to believe all of that. I don't, under, I don't want to know all that. And the, next, the very next thing you know, God's got a hold of their heart, and they're sitting on the front row saying amen to the preacher. Amen? Well, then we see, we see next, we see in verse 24, the blessing of Christ. Been dead to sin. It's our justification. Justified before God. I used to hear a preacher say that the next time the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Amen. And I've, we've been justified. And when we look at the accursed tree, we see his blessing to us. Therefore, being justified, Paul says, by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, you don't know, and I don't know, when God's call will come. But when we can, if I can go home tonight and lay my head on my pillow, or go to the hotel and lay down my, my head on my pillow, I can lay there with a clear conscience to know if God calls me in the night, I'll go home to be with Him. Praise God. All because of Calvary. All because of Calvary. But then I see in verse 24... I see his bonus. The bonus of Christ. That we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. You see, we don't have to serve sin. We can live unto righteousness. We don't have to, to wallow in that old cesspool. And when God saves a person, I believe, it's like the measles. It will break out on you. Amen. You can't help it. It's better felt than felt, Brother Rainey. But it'll show up somewhere. It'll show up somewhere. Paul said in the book of Titus chapter 2 verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denied ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, of the great God and Savior, our, uh, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Amen. Amen. When we look at the accursed tree and see, we see the body of Christ. We see the burden of Christ. And we see the bleeding of Christ, and the blessing of Christ, and the bonus of Christ. And folks, I'm going to tell you as you read the you read the, the perverted versions of Scripture, and they'll destroy all that the cross did. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, Demands my soul, my life, my all. May God help us, men, to love the Word of God, to preach it, to teach it, and stand for it. No matter what this world does, while hell is belching, we can stand for the Word of God. We may not can do a lot of things, but we can stand for the truth. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me, please? While we were going to read in just a moment, but let's have just a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we ask you, Lord, 
for us preachers and for us Christians, Lord, that you would turn our hearts to thee. Lord, we're a nation that's lost its way. And Father, I would ask you to turn us toward you. And Lord, whether we agree with our leaders or not, we are duty-bound by Scripture to pray for them. And Lord, we ask you to turn their hearts toward you. Lord, we're concerned, not for our sakes, we're concerned for our children and our, the future generations. And Father, we just ask you to help us to always stand for the purity of the Word of God and stand for the work of Christ on the cross. And the dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Lord, we thank you for the great salvation that's in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for our Bible, the King James Bible. Lord, I thank you for the Dean Burgon Society and these men that stand true to this, the book of God. And I would ask you, Lord, to help us to be faithful always. And Father, we'll praise you and thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're turning, we're turning to the book of Psalms, 119, and begin reading in verse 97. If you'll read with me, please. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Though, <clears throat> thou through thy commandments, though through thy, thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for, they, for, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. To God be the glory. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. We appreciate that very much. Dinner or supper is upon us. I'd like to read a few messages from the Internet. If you want to call us or email us, questions at bftbc.org. Questions at bftbc.org. Uh, we heard from Richard Cushing uh, from Newton, New Hampshire. They passed away. I want to thank everyone that helped to make this annual DBS meeting possible. I pretty much stand alone here on the text issue, so I'm greatly in need of the encouragement I receive from all the speakers. Praise the Lord from Richard Cushing. And then uh, we've decided that next year uh, at uh, Dr. Cooper's church in Marietta, Georgia, the dates for the meeting will be July 26 and 27, the same week of July as this particular year. July 27, 28 is this year, but 26 and 27 next year, 2017. Then the reports from the ones that are listening to us, sermonaudio.com, 34 visitors. Uh, the stream at one point throughout the day. I peaked with five people watching all at once. Uh, between five and seven were watching on YouTube. And then some 25 tune in at BibleForday.org. 23 from the USA, one from Brazil, one from Canada. We can estimate, therefore, this afternoon from 35 to 50 people watching on the Internet. So we appreciate that very much. All right, uh, uh, Dr. Spencer, want to come and... Uh, Invite us to dinner and uh, any other announcements, our host, pastor, uh, tonight. And lead us in a word of prayer, if you will. Well, this has been a great day, hasn't it? Amen. Amen. Challenge from the Word of God, challenge about the Word of God, and a commission for each one of us to proclaim the Word of God. A wonderful day and how we thank God for it. We have two more messages tonight. Hope you will all be staying for those. Looking forward to it with great expectation. 
and dinner is about to be served, I think tonight they really have a feast spread out for us over there. So uh, I know that all of you have probably put on two or three pounds since you've been here at the conference. We've not done a lot of exercise, mental exercise, spiritual exercise, but not a lot of bodily exercise. And so you are invited after the prayer, we'll have in just a moment, to please go quickly across and the ladies have things ready for us. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you for your word. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Father, we pray that you might indeed not only cause us to have an intake of the word of God, but that we might be very faithful in proclaiming the word of God regardless of the cost. To stand for the truth, to always speak the truth in love, but to speak the truth. And Father, now we thank you for the food which you have so graciously prepared through the hands of these ladies who are your servants. We pray, Father, that you will nourish our bodies, that you'll strengthen us, that you'll bless us in the use of the energy from that food, that we might glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Please come right across and we'll have dinner.